If you've watched my channel for any amount of time, you know I'm a big fan of these tiny mini micro form factor systems. They make for great inexpensive home servers or lightweight desktops, and you'd be surprised at just how much you can squeeze out of them, even the older models. But how old is too old? Well, that's what I sort of hoped to answer when I picked up this Lenovo M92P Tiny. Maybe you could go with something a little bit older, get most of the same benefits, but save some money in the process. Weirdly though, these aren't that much cheaper than some of the newer models. Now, it's possible that this is just the price floor of the used market, but, well, people keep buying these. So maybe I'm missing something. Did these older machines hold up better than expected? Did they have some hidden features that you wouldn't expect and don't get on newer models? Well, there's only one way to find out. If you've watched my videos, you know I'm a big fan of older systems and finding ways to put them to use. And you probably also know that I'm a fan of Private Internet Access, the sponsor of today's video. PIA is a great tool to have in your setup, whether you're just browsing the web or hosting your own services in a home lab. And yeah, I know if you're watching my videos, there's a decent chance you're thinking, why would I pay for a VPN when I can set up my own? And yeah, I actually have a couple of VPNs that I run on my own, but I also use PIA. Like any good VPN, it encrypts your network traffic and helps keep your online activity private. But it also gives you access to hundreds of servers across 91 different countries. This gives you lots of options and also serves as a great backup in case your VPN goes down. I've been using PIA now for almost a year and I've yet to have any issues. And I love that I can run it on as many devices as I want, whether that's my phone, my laptop, or even servers running Linux. In fact, I'm pretty sure I've mentioned a few times now that I use PIA with a Docker container called Gluten to easily tunnel multiple containers through PIA's servers. I also love that PIA has a strict no logs policy that's been independently verified. So if you're looking for a quality VPN service, make sure to check out private internet access by using my link down below where you can get 83% off plus four months for free. This is the Lenovo M92P Tiny. And at first glance, it probably looks pretty similar to some of the other tiny mini microsystems I've covered, but when you take a look at the specs, well, it really starts to show its age. This M72P features an Intel i5-3470T, an Ivy Bridge CPU from all the way back in 2012. This 13-year-old dual-core four-thread chip has base and boost clocks of 2.9 and 3.6 gigahertz respectively, and while it can support up to 32 gigabytes of DDR3 or DDR3 L SOTA memory, mine came with a whopping four gigabytes. On the front of the system, you'll find just the power button, two USB 3 ports, and the headphone and mic jacks. Then on the back, there's the power input, a display port, two more USB 3.0 ports, a VGA port, gigabit ethernet, and then one USB 2.0 port. Mine also has this big hole on the back for what I believe would have been an optional display port or com port. Opening it up, things get, well, a little bit more interesting. The first thing you'll notice is, well, this awkward SSD mount. Normally these have a little bracket for the SSD, but mine was missing apparently, so the 60 gigabyte Intel SSD was just Velcroed to the top of the case. The SSD is connected to the single SATA port on the motherboard via this little adapter cable. Sadly, there isn't much else to talk about with the internals of this system. Really, the only other I.O. is for this mini PCIe port, which I assume is for a Wi-Fi card that's also missing from my system. Now, assuming there's no shenanigans going on from Lenovo, we should be able to use this mini PCIe port to add some sort of PCIe devices or possibly even an SSD. There's two SODIMM sockets, so it would be pretty easy to upgrade the RAM and the CPU is socketed as well. So theoretically, we could upgrade this to something like an i7-3770T to get a true quad-core chip, but as we'll see here shortly, adding more power and heat into the system might not be the greatest idea. But who knows, maybe this little dual-core is surprisingly good despite its age. To test it out, I got it hooked up, powered it on, and fortunately had no issues getting into the BIOS. There, things were pretty simple, and I found a few settings to change immediately, like disabling the boot warning for knobbing a keyboard, and enabling virtualization support. There was one thing, though, that caught my eye. I was not expecting to see an option to enable Intel manageability, but after a quick search, it turns out this i5-3470T does in fact support Intel's AMT for remote management. And this could be a really nice feature, especially if you end up using this as a server of sorts, but we'll come back to that later. I installed Windows 10 and everything booted up just fine. Well, that is until I started to run some CPU benchmarks. Yeah, this thing was getting pretty toasty. Fortunately, one of the nice things about these tiny form factor systems is that they're really easy to get cleaned up. All I had to do was pop off the fan and CPU cooler, dust everything out really quickly, and reapply some fresh thermal paste. After that, well, yeah, thermals were still kind of bad. Even after enabling the performance fan curve in the BIOS, the CPU was still hitting almost 90 degrees Celsius under load and thermal throttling. 
And I think some of this has to do with just the thermal solution in general. It's kind of odd there's just a single blower fan that pushes air out the back, and then the CPU has a heat sink on the front that has this little inlet for air to come in through the front of the case. Actually, since I was already missing the little two and a half inch mount, I figured I might be missing like a little airflow guide or something, but uh, you can't really see here but this is just solid plastic on the side of this blower fan. And so there's not really like a direct way for air to go through here and then out the back. It has to go through here and then into the case and then get sucked through the blower fan and then out the back. So it's a little odd. Uh, actually, some people seem to have success flipping this fan around and pushing air out the front, which I didn't try, but honestly, it might've been worth it. Regardless, it's not a great thermal solution, it seems, and the CPU does get pretty hot. And because of that, this system does get pretty noisy and was noticeably louder than any of the other similar form factor systems I've looked at on this channel. So like I said, it's probably not a good idea to try to upgrade this with a more powerful CPU because, well, you might just be thermally limited anyway. And so you're probably sort of stuck with this i5-3470T. Which, if we dive into the Cinebench R23 multi-threaded benchmark, we get some pretty lousy scores. For comparison here, I grabbed the results from a Lenovo M1715Q Gen 2 with an AMD Ryzen 2400GE, as well as an HP Elite Desk G3 Mini with a Skylake i5-6500T. Oh, and I also grabbed the results from a little N100 Mini PC because everyone seems to like that comparison. Here you can see that the dual-core Ivy Bridge CPU was completely outclassed by all of the newer systems, at least in the multi-threaded test. When moving over to the single-threaded test, things get a bit more interesting. Here the i5-3470T was only about 10% slower than the Skylake i5, and only about 20% slower than the N100. Things don't look quite so good when it comes to efficiency. When running the Cinebench multi-threaded test, the M72P drew around 44 watts from the wall, which was more than any of the other systems. And it was, once again, also the worst performer by far. That being said, at idle, the M72P only drew 12.5 watts, which was still the worst performer, but not by that much, and really isn't that terrible. And not to get ahead of myself, but I was able to get that idle power draw down a little bit more here later on. Obviously, Cinebench isn't the end-all be-all, and mostly what I wanted to see from this system in Windows was, well, well, sort of how well it could run Windows. Could this system actually still work as a simple desktop system? Well, yeah, actually. I guess here the relatively adequate single-threaded performance went a long way, because whenever I was opening apps, browsing the web, and even watching YouTube, things were pretty snappy. Now with YouTube, I did start to have issues with 1440p and 4K content because the integrated HD Graphics 2500 doesn't have support for decoding VP9, but it could still handle 1080p just fine. And switching over to H.264 helped even more. I even hopped into Onshape for a bit, which I use for basic 3D CAD. And while things did get a little bit stuttery, it was very much usable, at least for some simple 3D print designs. One thing I always like to test with little systems like this is how well they can stream from another system. And for this, I installed Moonlight. And I don't know why I keep getting surprised that Moonlight works so well on older systems, but man, this worked really well when streaming from my gaming PC. I was limited to just H.264, but I was able to get hardware decoding working, and streaming from my gaming PC was actually really snappy and looked decent. Now, it was a little weird that I was streaming a 4K stream to a 1080p monitor, but it still looked pretty good, and it would have looked even better if I hooked up a 1440p monitor. Now, notice I said 1440p and not 4K, and that's because these older integrated graphics only support outputting up to 2560 by 1600. Now, I know there are already some comments down there screaming at me, why would you use Windows? Why wouldn't you use Linux? That would work so much better on this older system. And yeah, I know, I agree. But I like to run Windows for a few reasons, but one of those is really just because if it can run Windows, then it can probably run whatever Linux distro you want to run. But I did want to run Linux for some home server stuff, specifically Proxmox. Now, obviously I could have just installed Proxmox on another SATA SSD, but I wanted to see if I could take advantage of that mini PCIe slot. If I could boot off of an SSD using that, then I'd have the SATA port available for another drive that I could use for backups or media or whatever. Now, obviously I just can't stick an NVMe SSD in here, but with an adapter, I could go from mini PCIe to M.2 E key, and then with another adapter, I could go from E key to M key, and then with that, I could plug in this little 256 gig NVMe SSD. Now, yes, I know there are many PCIe to NVMe adapters that you could use, but I used what I had and it worked. In the Proxmox installer, the NVMe SSD was recognized and I got everything installed without any issues. Well, that is until I tried to boot from the NVMe SSD because I guess for some reason Lenovo thought no one would use this configuration ever. <laughs> Fortunately, there's a pretty easy fix out there that actually a lot of people mentioned in a previous video of mine, which is just to use a bootloader called Clover. For this, I followed a quick tutorial from Warning56KB, where I flashed Boot Disk Utility, which includes the Clover bootloader, to a USB drive. Then, in the UAFI settings, I told the system to boot from that said USB drive, and boom, it worked. 
Once again, sort of. Sadly, it turns out that many PCIe slot only seemed to support one lane of PCIe Gen 1, which meant this Gen 4x4 NVMe SSD basically had the same throughput as a mechanical hard drive. Now, I actually tested this off camera with multiple different PCIe devices using hardware info in Windows, and even though the slot technically reported that it was capable of PCIe Gen 2, everything would always just get downgraded to PCIe Gen 1, and I'm not really sure why. Still, it was a working boot drive, and using the Proxmox community scripts, I installed some VMs and LXE containers like Home Assistant, Jellyfin, and Crafty Controller. Oh yeah, and to make sure I could run all this stuff, I upgraded the RAM from 4GB to 8GB of DDR3L. For most things, this system ran just fine. The CPU performance, or lack thereof, started to become a problem with certain things like, for example, running Minecraft servers, where even when running a lighter weight paper MC server, terrain generation was pretty slow. In Jellyfin, I wasn't expecting much when it comes to hardware accelerated transcoding, which was, that was the right call. First of all, QuickSync isn't supported in Jellyfin with these older CPUs, so I had to fall back to using VAAPI, which technically I got working, but the performance just wasn't that great. With supported codecs like H.264, with a 4K file I was able to get decent playback with a little over 30 frames per second, but with unsupported codecs like HEVC, not to mention anything HDR, well, it was pretty much just a no-go. But for simpler things like Home Assistant, everything worked just fine. And in fact, when not running Windows and not having a display connected, I was able to get the idle power draw down to just 9 watts. Now, if you were thinking about using this as a home server or integrated into a home lab setup, there is one really helpful feature that I hinted at earlier, which is Intel's AMT for remote management. To get this working, I enabled AMT in the BIOS and then rebooted the system and hit Control P to get into the AMT setup. There, I created a password, made sure that things like KVM access were enabled, and then configured the network settings. Then using the IP I configured in the network settings, I used some software called Mesh Commander to remotely access the system. This meant I could power on or off the system remotely and have KVM access so that I could interact with the system even before booting into the OS. It's nothing crazy, but it definitely is a helpful feature to have if you plan on tucking this away somewhere or maybe rack mounting it. So yeah, this system is old, but is it too old? Well, no, at least not in my opinion. It still works fine for browsing the web, streaming videos, at least at 1080p, and even doing some remote gaming. As a home server, it's still very functional in a lot of use cases. And while the mini PCIe slot isn't amazing, especially at PCIe Gen 1 by one it does open up some expansion options via adapters. In fact, one thing you could do with this system that I haven't mentioned is pick up an adapter like this one here to give yourself an additional gigabit NIC, and then you just have to find a way to mount it in this little empty hole here. And yeah, you'd have a perfect little PFSense or OpenSense box. There are definitely plenty of ways that you could put this system to use, but it still does have some drawbacks. First of all, the integrated graphics are very outdated. Not having support for modern codecs and also not supporting 4K outputs definitely limits how well this can function as a desktop, home theater PC, or a streaming server. Also, it doesn't support NVMe, at least not in any sort of useful way, so the fastest storage you'll ever be able to work with is SATA SSDs. There's also just going to be times where a dual-core Ivy Bridge CPU isn't going to cut it, and realistically, there's no upgrade path. But the biggest problem is the price. When looking at sold listings on eBay, it's kind of odd because you'll see these M72P Tinies are selling for not that much less than systems with 6th or 7th gen Intel CPUs or some of the AMD Ryzen chips. With those systems, you're going to get more powerful and efficient CPUs, hardware acceleration for modern video codecs, native NVMe support, and probably an M.2 E key slot that you can use for some more networking or whatever, and not be limited to PCIe Gen 1. So really you can just spend not that much more and get a much more well-rounded system. At least with where prices are right now, there is no reason to go out and buy one of these. But if one of these just happens to fall in your lap, <laughs> But if one of these were to just fall, literally fall, smack your desk, but if one of these were to just fall into your lap or, I don't know, you picked it up for 15 bucks, it actually might not be that bad, and I'm sure you could find plenty of ways to put it to use. What do you guys think, though? Do you have any thoughts on this system? Have you ever used one? Is there anything really dumb I did in this video? Probably. Let me know down in the comments below. Also, while you're down there, maybe consider becoming a RAID member. If you don't like watching my videos with ads, you can spend as little as a dollar a month to get ad-free early access to all of my content, plus some other cool perks, so go check that out down in the description. That's about it for this one, though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one. I totally dropped that computer. I hope it's not broken. I dropped it. I'm a doofus. Hopefully no one edits this but me. All right.